In your Bibles, will you open once again to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. Luke, chapter 17. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 20. Luke 17, verse 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here, or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. If you have a Schofield Bible, there's a note here indicating we might translate this, For indeed, the kingdom of God is among you, or in your midst. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here, or look there. Do not go after them, or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part, under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. On the last Sunday of 1992 at 5.06 a.m. in the morning, little Jeremiah Caleb Swearingen saw the light of day for the first time. There was joy at his birth, as there usually is at the birth of any healthy and normal child, but most parents would not like to go through what the Swearingens went through to reach that very happy moment. You see, Michael and Susan Swearingen live out in Arlington. They had paid $600 up front for the service of three midwives who worked out of the family birthing center in Grand Prairie. When Susan Swearingen woke up that Sunday morning at 3.14 a.m. with uh, her pains beginning, she thought that was a false alarm, and so she waited about an hour before she called the midwives. Finally, she decided that she better call them, and she did. And while they were waiting for the midwives, Susan was lying on a small mattress on the floor. Her flustered and uh, nervous husband somehow managed to light a fire in the fireplace and to set up the video camera, hoping to catch the blessed event. Just in case, as they were waiting, he washed his hands four times. Later, he said to the media, I said to my wife to hold on. Don't push. <laughs> the midwives are on their way. When I saw the crown, I said, wait, you can't have it right now. And she said, oh, but I have to. It's coming. I've got to have it right now. So Michael Swearingen cupped the little old child's head in his hands. He unwound the umbilical cord from around the baby's neck and handed his son to his exhausted but smiling wife. Forty-five minutes after they had been called, the midwives showed up, and they observed uh, Susan Swearingen uh, sucking on some ice cubes made out of uh, orange juice and drinking hot tea and holding her seven-and-a-half-pound blue-eyed baby boy in her arms. Now, the Swearingens insist they still got their money out of the midwives. And uh, Susan Swearingen said, oh, they gave me and the baby an herbal bath. Oh, that was wonderful. And, of course, the midwives uh, did the other things that are related to afterbirth uh, performances, and they cut the umbilical cord and did whatever else they could. And as if uh, Michael Swearingen had not done enough, he dived in and made homemade pancakes for the midwives and sat around and talked with them as they ate. Susan Swearingen said... Uh, Many husbands couldn't do it, but Michael could. He's a good man. I'm blessed to have him. And oh yes, folks, the Swearingens are blessed in another way as well. 
This was not their first experience uh, with having a child. In fact, young Jeremiah Caleb Swearingen just happened to be numero siete, number seven for the Swearingens. Now, against the background of a story like that, with all of its luster and stress and tension, it isn't surprising, is it, that the final period of human history, which we call the tribulation period, is described in the Bible as a period of time to be compared with labor pains coming on a pregnant woman. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian Christians, and he said to them, You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, as labor pains, on a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And just as surely as Susan Swearingen woke up, experiencing her pains, one of these days, this world in which we live, which is slumbering in a moral and spiritual stupor, will be awakened by the labor pains of divine judgment, and disaster after disaster after disaster will strike the world as the world goes through the process which will give birth to a new age, to the establishment of the kingdom of God. Now, it's not, not going to be my job up here this morning, folks, to scare you with all of the catastrophes that are going to happen during the period that we call the tribulation of the great tribulation. If you want to read about them, you can find that recorded in Revelation 6 through 18. What I want to do this morning is to draw out another truth, which is also illustrated in the story of Michael and Susan Swearingen. And the truth is this, that despite the labor pains, here comes joy. And you won't be surprised to discover that that also happens to be the title of my message to you this morning. Despite the labor pains, here comes joy. Do you ever wonder when in the world we are going to stop getting new information which tells us how corrupt and how sinful American society is. Just when we thought we had heard everything, this past week, the electronic and print media told us about the problem of sexual abuse in our schools. And a survey of 1,600 students in grades 8 to 11 turned up the fact that 81% of them and had some experience which might be described as sexual abuse. And it wasn't just simply the girls, although 85% of them reported in the affirmative. But 76% of the boys also reported that in one form or another, verbal or physical, they had experienced sexual abuse. And when we hear information like that, we are tempted to ask the question, how long is this going to go on? When is this going to stop? When is God going to step in and put an end to this type of thing? Or to put it in another way, when will the kingdom of God appear? And you know that that is precisely the question that Jesus was asked in the passage of scripture that we read just a few minutes ago, of course it was a question that came from the Pharisees. And knowing the Pharisees who were not notorious for their faith in Jesus, and knowing that the Pharisees understood that many people believed that Jesus was the promised king, their question about the coming of the kingdom of God might have been scornful, it might have been sarcastic, but they asked, when will the kingdom of God appear? Maybe they have something like, okay, king, if you're the king, 
Give us some information. When will the kingdom of God appear? And I want to assure you, folks, that the answer that they got from Jesus was totally unexpected. It was something that did not compute for the mind of the Pharisees. The fact that this exchange had been a football game, we might say that the Pharisees didn't get beyond the nine scrimmage. And that when Jesus answered them, he threw them for at least a 20 yard ball. For in response to their question, Jesus says this. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Neither will they say, see here, or see then. For indeed, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Say what? Say what? That wasn't what the Pharisees understood about the kingdom of God. They knew that the kingdom of God was coming in the future in power and great glory. They knew it was going to be established in the city of Jerusalem and that from Israel the whole world would be ruled. They thought above all things that the kingdom of God would come with observation. And Jesus says, no, it doesn't. The kingdom of God is among them. What did he mean? Do you know what he meant? Do you understand what he meant? Do you realize that whenever an unsaved sinner believes on the Lord Jesus Christ for the free gift of everlasting life, that in that very moment of faith in Christ, he is not only born into the family of God forever, but he becomes a citizen of the kingdom of God. How do I know that? Because Paul told us, writing to the Colossians, he said to the Colossian Christians, God has delivered us from the power of darkness, and he has conveyed us, he has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Did you know that in the midst of mankind this morning, there are literally millions of citizens of the kingdom of God. And you can't see when a person becomes a citizen of that kingdom because nobody can see what God does in our heart. And this particular kingdom has no particular location wherever Christians happen to be at the time. That's where the kingdom is. Did you know that this morning, a part of God's kingdom is in this auditorium, consisting of everyone who is believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. But when this auditorium empties this morning, folks, the kingdom of God will be here anymore. Because the kingdom of God is not localized just yet. It is composed of people who have been transferred into God kingdom. Kurt Wagner was a bodyguard for Adolf Hitler. He adored Hitler. He reverenced this man as if he was almost a god. But after the war, as Hitler lay dead in his Berlin bunker, Kurt Wagner's faith in his Fuhrer collapsed. And he decided to take his own life. He went for a cup of coffee, a final cup of coffee. And on his way, he noticed the gospel tract and picked it up. And at first he read it carelessly, and then he read it with more seriousness. And motivated by the gospel tract, he visited a Christian pastor who led him to faith in Christ. Striking story. Here is a man about to be ruined in the collapse of Hitler's empire. And God snatches him through his faith in Christ out of the ruins of the Third Reich. And he transfers him into the kingdom of his dear son. And the question this morning is, 
Has that happened to you? Do you know for sure that you are a member of the family of God and that you are a permanent citizen of the kingdom of God? Do you know that for sure? If you don't, you can know it this morning. You can know it right now. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, he that believes in me has everlasting life. And he also said, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, shall not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. And if you hear those words this morning, and if you believe that they are true, they guarantee to you that you have eternal life, that you will never come into condemnation, that you have already passed out of death into life. Yes, the kingdom of God is in the midst of the world, composed of every single individual who has believed in Jesus for the free gift of everlasting life. But that's only the beginning. That's only the beginning, isn't it? For you see, once we know that we are members of the invisible kingdom that is here, right here and now, we can begin to look forward to the kingdom that will indeed come with observation. We are silently translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And that is not by observation. God alone sees it. But someday the kingdom that is now invisible will be manifested. And we can look forward to that. And did you notice that in our passage of scripture, after replying to the Pharisees, Jesus turns to his own disciples. He turns to the men who believed in him and who loved him, basically. And this is what he said. He said, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. Then they'll say to you, see here, or see there. Don't go after them, don't follow them. For as the lightning that flashes from one end of heaven shines to the other end of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. Now I need to tell you something. But in the prophetic parts of the Bible, the word day is often used as, as if it almost meant manifestation, revelation. And when Jesus says to his disciples, you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, I think he is saying you will desire to see one of the manifestations, one of the revelations of the Son of Man. Do we all understand that there are two of them? Those of us who are sitting here, right here and now, are looking forward to one of those days. We are looking forward to the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will appear to us to take every true Christian out from this world in which we live. And then will come the period of time called the tribulation, the travail pains of God's judgment. But at the end of that period, the Lord Jesus Christ will appear again, and this time to the entire world. And he will do so in order to establish his kingdom. And don't you see that all the disciples of Jesus who are dedicated to him are looking forward to one of those days. We are looking forward to the first of those days, which will come just as the judgments of the tribulation begin. The disciples who will live during the final seven years of world history will look forward to another of those all of us are drawn by the hope, the desire, the expectancy of the Savior's return. Now some of you may be a little surprised to hear that when I was a little boy, I was a horror movie junkie. I mean, I love to see horror movies. 
And my number one favorite monster was the Frankenstein monster. And my number two favorite monster, who ran just very closely to I'm number one in my mind, was the wolf thing. And I love to go see movies, either featuring Frankenstein or featuring Wolfman. And when I was still in fourth grade, my family moved to a little city called Glen Burnie in Maryland. And I understand that we only lived there for about a month. But shortly after we got there, I saw the greatest movie advertisement I had ever seen. Coming soon to the Glen Burnie Theater folks was a horror movie entitled Frankenstein Meets Wolfman. Two for the price of one. And in my childish mind, that was the best deal in the history of movies. But I had to wait for it, folks. And my, I was dying to see that movie. Day passed after day passed after day passed. And it seemed a long time, but since we only lived there a month, they couldn't have been more than a couple of weeks. And finally it came. And there I sat in the movie theater, and what kid in the fourth grade could not fail to be impressed by that dramatic fight between Frankenstein's monster and the wolf man right at the end of the movie, right in Dr. Frankenstein's castle, and the castle was crumbling on top of that, and eventually they were buried under the rubble, and everybody on the screen thought that the monsters was dead, were dead, but I knew better. I knew they would come back when they made another movie picture. And I have to admit that that was boyish enthusiasm. That was childhood impatience. I just couldn't wait to see that marvelous movie. But may I suggest that in the heart of every dedicated disciple of Christ, there is something of that same childhood he is. That boyish impatience and anxiousness to see the day when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven. And we have to go through a lot of days without seeing it. Jesus says the days will come when you want to see one of those days. And you won't be able to see it, he says. But don't give up, says Jesus. And don't listen to anybody who says to you, well, he came secretly. He's over there, see there? Or he's over there, see there? Or to put it into modern terms, he's in a farm compound down outside of Wakefield. Jesus says, don't believe any of that stuff. Don't believe that sort of thing. When I come, everybody will see it. You'll all see it. For as the lightning that shines from one end of heaven shines to the other end of heaven, even so shall the Son of Man be in his death. Have you ever stopped to think about this? One of these days, you're going to be going around your ordinary business at work. Or you're going to be lounging in your easy chair at home. And suddenly, you're going to see the most brilliant flash of lightning that you have ever seen. And you're going to look up into that blazing light. And you're going to see the king coming down from heaven. You're going to feel yourself being lifted up to meet him in the air, and for what a thrill that will be. Now I'm going to confess to you, last month I looked for that day and did not see it. Last week I looked for that day and did not see it. Yesterday, I looked for that day and did not see it. Today, I am looking for that day and, hey, the day is over before. We might see it. 
to them. Pastor Earl Kelly was the preacher one Sunday morning at the First Baptist Church in Holly Springs, Mississippi. He was preaching on the coming of the Lord. And he was quoting a verse in Matthew, which is very similar to the verse we have here about the lightning shining from one end of heaven to the other. So shall the Son of Man be in his coming. And as he spoke, suddenly a light bulb fell from its socket in the ceiling of the church, <laughs> and it smashed in front of the pulpit. And the congregation was shocked. <laughs> And uh, they woke up if they were asleep. And Pastor Kelly had the presence of mind to say this. He, he said the coming of Christ will be just as sudden, just as unexpected, just as shattering to every dream that is not Christ-centered as that. Yeah. Yeah. When the lightning flashes, folks, all of our selfish dreams and ambitions will smash like that light bulb. But it is the disciples of Jesus Christ who love his appearing, who long for his appearing, and who can sing from their hearts, the Lord I love is coming soon. It may be morning, night, or noon. My lamps are trimmed. I'll watch and pray. It may be soon. It may be today. But first, <laughs> but first, these are the words with which the last statement in our passage begins. Jesus says, but first, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. You see, the kingdom of God could not have come at the time that Jesus was speaking. You know what? If it had come, there would have been no human being there. It would have been a kingdom for angels only. For we as people were utterly sinful and corrupt, worthy only of being cast aside forever into the lake of fire. So first, First, before his kingdom could come, he must die. He must pay the price for our sins. He must buy our citizenship in heaven. And that's what he did. And as we said earlier, we receive our citizenship in the kingdom of God when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the free gift of everlasting life. So now, the work of the cross is over with. What Jesus said had to come first has already been done. What is that? Nothing. Nothing. As far as the testimony of the prophetic word is concerned. Jesus is not only coming. He could come. Yeah. Back in the days when newspaper articles were sent by teletype machines, there was an editor in the city of Pittsburgh who assigned a young cub reporter to cover a mining disaster that had taken place in Cokeville, which was not very far from Pittsburgh. The young reporter went to Cokeville and for some reason he dallied around and, and finally it was late at night before he began to file his report. And so in order to add some flair and drama to his report, this is what he began to file as his story from Cokeville. Cokeville, PA, number 300. God sits on the hills around Cokeville. Now, the editor was looking at the teletype machine as the message came in. As soon as he read that much, he teletyped the message back to the reporter. I don't know whether the editor was serious or kidding, 
But here was the message of the editor sent back to the reporter. He says, never mind about the mighty disaster. Interview God. Get pictures. <laughs> Okay, so there's going to be disaster when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. The labor pains of the tribulation period. They are tragic, but they are necessary. But never mind about the disaster, folks. We are going to get to interview the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get to speak to him in person. And we'll do a whole lot better than pictures, won't we? Because we'll see him face to death. Standing before him at last. Trials and troubles all past. Crowns at his feet we will cast. Jesus is coming again. Coming again. Coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, <laughs> what a wonderful day that will be. Jesus is coming again. Shall we pray? Father, what a glorious message you have given to us. Salvation by faith and by faith alone. And the Savior who is coming again. Fathers, we go into the baptismal service. May our hearts be alive with these truths. May we with rejoice with each person who is baptized. That they have become citizens in your kingdom forever. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.